Hey everybody, thanks for joining us online. We're gonna sing some songs together. I'm Danny, so wherever you are right now, just sing with us, okay? Here we go. This is the day you have made. Never comes, I won't complain. For all my hope is in your name. And now your joy awaits my praise. I give thanks, come on. I give thanks for all you have done. And I will see of your
search the world But it couldn't fill me Birds and he prays Treasures the same Never enough And you came Every 
worship you, we know that you are the only one who can. The graves that are in every one of our lives, Father, everything, those things that have died, those things that are broken in our lives, God, we know that you can turn those graves into gardens. God, that you can turn something really ugly into something beautiful. So God, I pray that for the person that's watching right now. God, everybody has something that's broken. Everybody has something that only you can fix. So God, I ask that you would turn graves into gardens in our lives, Father. We pray and ask all these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Newport. I want to welcome each and every one of you. I want to give a special shout out to all of our campuses. I am just so proud of you. Those of you in Dover and Canton and Worcester, Millersburg, Coshocton and Cambridge, it's so exciting to hear stories about what's happening at each of your campuses. And I want to thank you for your giving and for your faithfulness and for your willingness to continue to serve because you are making a difference in our world. And so thank you. I also want to welcome those of you who are joining us online. Uh, we're in a series called The Illusion. It's not always what you think. And if you wanna know more information about this, one of the resources that I'm relying upon is a book that's called Live No Lies, John Mark Comer. It's a great book, it's helped me in this series, and I would encourage you to be able to get it as well. Now, we've all heard, we've all read of crazy stories, haven't we? That's happened in our world. And uh, it's uncommon for you and I to be able to, to turn on the news or maybe to go to Facebook and find a positive story. You know, the fact of the matter is most of the news is filled with stories that show the worst of humanity. Sad to say. And there's always a debate, isn't there, about whose fault it is and who's to blame. And most people, they just chalk it up to bad people, evil people. And while there certainly is a lot of blame to go around, the majority of us hardly ever think about the spiritual world, the invisible world, if you will, and how it impacts the way in which people think and what people do. You see, what happens is we've kind of made fun of it, haven't we? We've kind of trivialized things like the devil, and we'll just say, ah, you know, it's, let's blame it on the devil. It's, let's, let's just give him all the, the, the blame and fault for this. And we've even said, it's the devil who, what, made me do it. And what we need to understand is the devil can't make you do anything. He can't. Now, what he can do is he can tell you lies. He can tell you have truths We can't ignore that. And he will do that consistently. He, he will... He will protect uh, illusions and half-truths 
and deception before you to try to influence you, to try to get you to do something, but he himself can't do anything. And yet those illusions and those lies and those half-truths have the ability to what? To influence us, to move us, to cause us to do things, to cause us to have what? Wrong motives. And yet if you and I willfully choose to be ignorant of all of this, okay, this invisible world, this enemy called the devil, you will find yourself in a very dangerous place. And maybe you've already found yourself there. And you've said, how on earth did I get here? I did what? How could I have done that? And that's why we're taking time to be able to pull back the curtain on the devil's schemes and strategies and tricks and illusions that he has for you and me to disrupt your life, to discourage you, to dismantle the very things that you love and that God loves. Now, in our first message, I shared with you that not only did Jesus believe in the devil, but the apostle Paul believed in the devil. And he gave us some instructions. And here's what he said in Ephesians 6, 11. He said, put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. Now this is encouraging, okay? Because he says, so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies, all schemes, all illusions of the devil. So there's hope for us. So what he is saying is this, is that God has given you and I equipment. He's given you and I tools so that you and I can unmask the devil and his schemes and his strategies and his tricks so that you and I don't have to be caught off guard. We don't have to be ignorant about it. And so what I want to do today is I want to deconstruct Satan's strategy for you and for me and for the entire human race so that we don't fall prey to his illusions or his half-truths. Now, I wanna go back and remind us of what Jesus said about the devil. And here's what he said. There is a literal devil. He's immaterial, but he's an intelligent being. Secondly, he said, is that his mission is to destroy, discourage, disrupt, dismantle, destroy you and me. And he does that by spreading ruin in the hearts of men and women, and in society. And then his strategy is to use half-truths. And this is his primary means. He wants to use half-truths. He wants to present illusions that will tell you and I just enough truth that it will perk your interest and my interest, and we'll believe in it. You see, all the other stuff that goes on, you know, maybe the suffering, the frustration, even sickness, all of those things are secondary. They're secondary. We have a tendency to put them first, but they're secondary. His signature moves is illusions, half-truths, lies, deception. Jesus knew this. And this is why Jesus said that our fight, our fight is to believe the truth and reject the lies, reject the illusions. And that your soul and my soul, your spirit, my spirit, your mind, my mind is locked into a, 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 a war of lies and that we have to understand that. And so I'm calling you to fight. I'm calling you to suit up, to put on the full armor of God. I'm calling you to war. And you might say, Dwight, I think you're a little bit delusional. But I would bet that you've been asking some of these questions over the past two years, and probably all of your life. Why is my mind under so much distress? You know, why do I have these thoughts? Why do I feel like sometimes I'm going crazy? Why is anxiety so high in my life? Why, why do I keep coming back to the same defeating behavior? Why is there a constant stream of negative and bad news that just comes in waves? Why does the injustice rage when so many of us would say it's evil? Why is that? You see, our fight against the devil 
is first and foremost is to take back our minds. To be able to take back our minds and to be able to know the truth and to be able to liberate our minds so that we can walk in freedom and not lies. You see, Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth will what? The truth will set you free. You see, what if, just what if, Jesus understands and knows reality better than you and me? That's why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and the life. What if in our world we're trying to solve problems without dealing with the root cause? What if in all of our science and all of our technology and political theories, we're actually oblivious, maybe willfully ignorant of all the facts? And so what happens is we stay in this form, this cycle of frustration because we can't solve it because we are oblivious to the true facts that there's an invisible world and there's an entity. His name is Satan and he wants to discourage, disrupt, dismantle and destroy. You see, he's a murderer, Jesus called him. And what is a murderer? Someone who intends to end life. Life, it's a war. And we feel, at least I do, I, I feel this opposition every single day. Every single day, I feel this opposition coming against me. There's a constant inner tension between opposing desires in my heart and in my life of to love and trust, and maybe to be honest and to save my face or self-control and indulgence. You see, there's a father of lies, and he is the original point of deception, of illusion. And, and, and as I've read and studied, Jesus, in all of his teaching, especially his most in-depth teaching on the devil, there is no mention of demons. There's no mention of tragedy. There's no mention of illness in his teaching. All of the other stuff, the demons and illness, and all the things that wreak havoc in our natural world, you know, the bad dreams, all of that. Now, that's, that's all biblical and accurate, and it needs to be taken serious. But the fact of the matter is, all that stuff is secondary. It is secondary. Jesus sees as our primary issue is that Satan wants to deceive you. He wants to bring about illusions in your life, half-truths in your life. He wants you to believe those over truth. And so what I want to do is I want to give you some basic terms that you need to understand if we're going to be able to pull back the curtain and to be able to expose his strategies and his schemes and his plan. So let me give them to you. The first one is just truth is absolute reality. What is absolute reality? It's what you run into when you're wrong. Let me give you an example, okay? It's like somebody saying, hey, I don't believe in the law of gravity. And you take them to a building. Let's say that it has 12 stories. And you climb up to the very top. And then they step outside that window. Guess what happens, my friend? They get a good dose of reality. They get the cold, hard truth. And, and our world has a hard time, our culture has a hard time understanding this simple truth, and that is reality. The Barna Group, they do surveys and, 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 and they do all kinds of things to be able to understand what people are thinking and doing in life. They found out, listen to this, that only, I believe it's 9% of all college graduates believe in absolute truth. Wow. Can you see how dangerous that is? When you have an enemy who uses half-truths and uncertainty to promote his lies, to promote his illusions, wow, that's an entire generation. You see, what happens is this. Absolute reality is rejected simply because what happens is sometimes there's some cold, hard truth 
that we have to embrace. And it's easier to believe maybe a half-truth or a lie because it's more comfortable. It's more convenient. It's more satisfying for the moment. It sounds better. It feels better. It's more accepted. But what we have to understand is truth is absolute reality. Here's a second basic term I want us to become familiar with, and that is lies or counterfeit reality. When you run into something um, that you find out is wrong, okay, you call it what? A lie. Why? Because it doesn't correspond with what is true. And counterfeit reality sometimes appears real, but it's anything but real. It's like building your life on a counterfeit reality or lie. Here's what I mean by that. It's like, let, let, let's say that, that you were saving counterfeit bills and, and you were saying, you know what, honey, someday we're gonna buy a house. Someday we're gonna have a boat. Someday we're gonna have a car. And, and you've been saving all these counterfeit bills and you go in to, to buy the boat. You go in to buy the, the car. You go in to, to purchase the, the home, to lay down a, 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 a deposit. And they laugh at you. And what happens is they tell you, you know what? Your money is absolute useless because it's counterfeit. You see, lies are counterfeit reality. Ultimately, your world will come crumbling down, falling apart. Here's another term I want us to become uh, familiar with. Ideas are assumptions about reality. Ideas are assumptions about reality. Now, we all have ideas, okay? We all have thoughts. We all have imaginations. God's given you one. God's given me one. But what is important to know is just because you have an idea, just because you have a thought, doesn't make it reality. It's simply what? An assumption about what reality actually is. And so you have to understand that ideas are assumptions about reality. Truth is absolute reality. Lies are counterfeit reality. Ideas are assumptions about realities. And then here's another term I want us to get. That is mental maps. All of us have mental maps, okay? That's the way in which we think. Mental maps are a collection of ideas by which we navigate life, okay? We live by what psychologists say are mental maps of reality. That means that there are reference points. Something has happened in your life, something has happened in my life, which I've experienced, okay? And now it becomes a map for me for the future. You know, a cat that sits on a hot stove won't sit on a what? Cold stove, why? Because he has a map, okay? And reference points in our minds by which we navigate our world. And this is that worn path in your mind that you have participated in and that you have experienced and that you have seen over and over and over again. It's your go-tos. It's the way in which you interpret things in your life. It can be instinctive, okay? Something that, that you do without thinking. It's that well-worn path by which you perceive life. Let me just say it like this. Mental maps are established on a collection of ideas that can be true or can be lies. And, and so it's like the way in which you go to work. You know, have you ever said, you know what, I, I, I just can jump in the car and I can just go to work, I, I, I don't need, because you have a map, okay? But have you ever gone to work and you run into a sign that says the road is closed? What do you do there? You're frustrated, you're angry, because now you're going to be what? You're gonna be late because you didn't realize that. And your mental map led you to a dead end. You just said, well, this is the way in which I go to work. And the mistake that we make sometimes is this. Our mental maps are not always updated. And your job, my job, your responsibility, my responsibility is to make sure that our mental maps, okay, the collection of ideas by which we navigate life are corresponding with reality. And so if your mental maps are true, then guess what? They correspond with reality. If they're not, then guess what? We end up getting lost. We end up being displaced. And, and you have maps and I have maps for money, for marriages, for work, for parenting, for families. 
all of that. And it's a collection of ideas. Sociologists talk about worldviews. But those who are followers of Christ, we talk about faith in a God who knows truth, who is truth, who leads us into truth. You see, here's what I want you to get by all these basic terms. And here's the devil's strategy. The devil attacks us by using deceitful ideas that play into our desires, okay, and are normalized in a sinful society. Wow. So here's what I want you to get, okay? Deceptive ideas, that's the devil, he comes, illusions, okay? And he plays into our disordered desires, that's our flesh, that's our body, okay? Our five senses, into a sinful society. That is the world. And what I wanna do is I just wanna break down with the time that I have these three ideas because we wanna pull back the curtain on how the enemy creates an illusion for you and me. So let's look at this, all right? The first one is deceptive ideas. That's the devil, okay? Now, here's what Jesus said about the devil. You are the father of the devil, and it's your will to practice the desires which, you are, which are characteristics of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning. That's Jesus describing the devil. And does not stand in truth, because there is no truth in him. He's full of illusions. He's full of deception. When he lies, he speaks what is natural to him, for he is a liar and the father of lies and half-truths. See, Dallas Willard says it like this, ideas are assumptions about reality. And what can happen is this, they are working theories usually based on some kind of experience or evidence that you have experienced in your life. And you think, ah, this is how life works. And what happens is you can get bought into an idea that really isn't completely true. You say, how is that? Well, we, we buy into the idea of what will make us happy, what will make me feel good. And so what happens is we can live in a world of ideas that we navigate, okay, of this will make me happy, that will make me happy. And happiness is an idea. So is democracy, so is human rights, so is freedom, even theology. You see, our, listen to me, our ideas form a mental map in which you and I use to navigate through reality. And guess what? The human being, you and I, have the ability to hold ideas that correspond with reality and ideas that does not correspond with reality. You see, we're the only creatures who can do that. Animals can't do that. Okay, and so there's a negative side, okay, and there's a positive side of imagination because what happens is we have the, the capacity to be able to hold multiple ideas. So we can, we can hold to the positive side, that's the capacity of imagination, but we can hold to the side of that which is unreal, okay, unreal in our minds, and that can be our Achilles heel. And so because of that, what we need to realize is this. The enemy can play to that. God's given you and I an imagination. He's given you and I to be able to think in the area of ideas. But if we're not careful, an idea is an assumption. Doesn't mean that it's true. And so we can't put our faith in just ideas that are untrue. We have to put our faith in a person whose name is Jesus. You see, when we believe the truth, ideas that correspond with reality, we flourish and we thrive. And we tend to be what? We tend to be happy. We just tend to be happy. When we believe in ideas that are not congruent, okay, with the reality of, of God's wisdom and design for life, we struggle to flourish. We struggle to thrive. Because reality does, listen to me, reality does not adjust itself to our illusions. I love what Scott Peck, a psychologist, wrote many years ago. He said that the devil is a real spirit of unreality. And that's why Jesus called the devil the father of lies. The devil's lies, okay, aren't just random. They're just not untrue facts with no emotional appeal, okay? 
He's not asking you and I today to believe. Hey, guess what? I just want you to know Elvis is alive. He never did die. That's not what he, he plays on. He plays to your emotions and my emotions. He'll say, hey, you know what? You deserve to be happy. You deserve to be happy. And let's face it, you haven't been happy in your marriage for a long, long time. So you know what? If you want to be happy, get a divorce. Leave him. Leave her. And we sin because we live a lie about what will make us happy. He'll tell us a little bit of truth, but he'll leave a lot of that out. And ultimately, sin is an unwillingness, hear me on this, to trust God for what actually will satisfy you and me, that God is wise and that he is good and that he has your best interest. He has my best interest. And that following his truth will ultimately satisfy us. You see, the devil's primary target is God's character, his word, his truth, so that it undermines our trust. And so what happens is sin sabotages our capacity for happiness by appealing to what? Our God-given desires, okay, for happiness, that's good, via deceptive ideas. You see, and what happens is Satan will come to you and me and he'll give us the idea because things aren't going the way in which we want it in life, that God is not good, that God is not wise, that God is holding out on you. That's exactly what he did in the garden with Eve. And if you and I, what he wants you and I to do is to seize autonomy from God and to be able to do our own thing and says, hey, you know what? I got a better idea. This is what will really make me happy. I'll be better off if I do this. And it undermines all the truth that God has for you that will set you free. And so this plays in to the second point of the strategy, and that is this, disordered desires, the flesh. Okay, deceptive ideas, and then it goes and plays into the disordered desires that you and I have. Paul writes about this in Ephesians. He says, at one time, we all lived among them, meaning those who, who walked according to the flesh, okay? Our desires were controlled by sin. Nothing wrong with desires. God's given it to us. It's just what's controlling that. We tried to satisfy what they tried to satisfy what they wanted us to do. We followed our desires and thoughts. You see, he's basically referring here to, to uh, you and I being more like an animal. Animals are driven for self-gratification. And this is the result of living in a what? A fallen world. A fallen world. And so most people don't recognize that temptation in their life is played on their minds. And what happens is it ignites the sinful nature in you and in me that we're born with. And we come up with these ideas. And these ideas play into the disordered desires. Desires are okay, they're just out of order. And it plays on our hearts that are deceptive. You see, listen, not all desires are created equal. At least they're not equally beneficial, okay? Some lead to what? Some desires lead to life and freedom and peace. But other desires lead to what? Slavery, death, and fear. You see, what happens is healthy people, people who are centering their life on truth, they're able to self-edit the inner misguiding desires, the disordered desires in their life. They're able to recognize that pleasure and happiness is not the same. That, that, that pleasure really is dopamine. Serotonin is about happiness. Pleasure is about the next hit to feel what? Good in the moment. Happiness is about contentment over the long haul. Pleasure is about want. Happiness is about freedom from want. Happiness has become about a feeling, feeling good, but not necessarily being good. The good life has resulted in about you and I being self-centered and not really wanting truly 
that which is good. Self is now the new God. Self is now the new spiritual authority. I got to do what is best for me. I got to do what is right for me. Self is now the new morality, okay? Stay true to who? Stay true to self. Justify self. Validate your greatness. The only problem with this, my friends, is the pressure is exhausting. That's why I believe we have such a pandemic of anxiety and burnout and mental health because of that. You see, look at what Paul writes in Galatians. Do not be deceived. Check that word. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, that's the disordered desires. From the flesh, he will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Wow. Notice the three, okay? He says, don't be deceived. That's deceitful desires. He says, don't sow to the flesh. That's the disorder desires that we have. And then he says, for whoever sows to the flesh will reap what? Destruction. But whoever sows to the spirit will reap eternal life. Why? Because everything has a cause and effect. And our freedom expands or shrinks with each decision that we make. Now, let me give you this last one, and that is this. The last one is a sinful society. That's the world. And, and, and John Mark Comer gives us a description, a definition of the world when he writes this. A system of ideas, values, moral practices, and social norms that are integrated into the mainstream and eventually institutionalized in a culture corrupted by the twin sins of what? Rebellion against God and the redefinition of good and evil. Wow, wow. You see, 2,000 years ago, the disciple John wrote about it when he wrote this. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the the world, okay? And what's he say here? The lust of the flesh. That's basically sexual temptation. It's more than that, but, but, but it involves that. He says the lust, the lust of the eye, that is greed. That's also envy and, and, and jealousy. And then he mentions the pride of what? The pride of life. That's rebelling against authority, thinking that we know better. We have our ideas, and our ideas are right no matter what the truth says. And these are the temptations that Jesus faced in the wilderness. And Jesus won. Why? Because he came back to that which was true. He didn't believe the half-truths, the illusions that Satan was offering him in the wilderness. And he won out. And he was victorious. And this same Jesus said a little over 2,000 years ago, there is an invisible world. There is a devil, and he's a murderer, and he wants to discourage, disrupt, dismantle, destroy everything, and he will not tip his hand because if he does, he knows that you and I will figure it out. So he will come through illusions, half-truths, deceptions, and he will want to dismantle everything that you love, destroy everything that you love, and we cannot allow this to happen. And so this is why you and I need to be aware. This is why I'm pulling back the curtains. I, I believe something that all of us need to pray for our families every single day. We need to pray this for ourselves. It's this, it's found in Proverbs 38. Keep deception and lies far from me. When's the last time you prayed that prayer? God, I pray that you'll make me feel better. God, I pray that you'll make me successful at my work. God, I, I pray that you'll keep me healthy. Those are all secondary levels. See, what happens is we need to be able to say, God, help me to see as you see, so I will do as you have said. Help me to see life, not through the lens of, of culture or through the lens of deception 
or through the lens of even my emotions and my own ideas. I want to see it as you see it because there's an enemy out there. There's an illusionist out there. There's a deceiver out there, and he wants to deceive me. He wants to deceive me about marriage. He wants to deceive me about family. He wants to deceive me about my money. He wants to deceive me about life. And I do not want that to happen. And so let's pray. God, keep deception and lies far from me because you have an enemy who wants to disrupt your life, dismantle your life, and destroy your life. Would you pray with me? God, today we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he was tempted in every way that we are. Satan tried to use deceptive ideas. He tried to play on his disorder desires in a sinful world, and yet Jesus relied upon truth. And I pray today that we would be people who would pray, keep me from deceptions and from lies, so that what happens is we can live the life that you have for us, one that's good, one that is rewarding, one that flourishes, and one that thrives. And so may we put Jesus at the center of our life in all that we do and all that we say because we have an enemy who wants to deceive us, destroy us, disrupt us, and dismantle us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray these things and believe. Amen. Thank you, Dwight, for another amazing message. Hey, it's through your generosity and God's faithfulness that we're able to bless others. And so if you haven't partnered with us yet, we wanna ask you to do that. We wanna consider four easy ways that you can partner with us. You can give online, you can download our mobile app, you can text to give, or you can give at any of our physical locations across Northeast Ohio. As always, make sure you keep up with us on all of our social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, to keep up to date on everything that's happening at New Point. Hey, it's been another amazing week. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you next time.